Hello. Happy New Year to one and all. Happy 2021. What time is it, Mr. Wolf? You may remember this as a game when one person, the wolf, opposed the entire group. The wolf would turn its back. The object of the game was that the others, not wolves, would be the last to get caught. Anyone could call out. What time was it? The wolf would respond with some time, and everyone was permitted to advance one step. And as the wolf kept answering with various times until at last he cried out 12 o'clock, the wolf was free to turn and try to tag as many of the others as he could. Those tag became part of the wolf's team, and on the next turn would join the wolf in catching the prey. Fun game. Perhaps you enjoyed it. We did. High-spirited, loads of running and exercise. But today, many would look and see the confusion and the fear and the chaos, and they would say, what time is it? The doomsday clock, which is set as to how close the world is to the end of civilization as we know it, tells quite a story right now. In 2017, the clock was set to two and a half minutes to midnight. Again, in 2018, it was advanced by another 30 seconds. And in 2020, it is now 100 seconds to midnight. It's lost another 20 seconds. This is the closest to doomsday we've ever been in the history of the doomsday clock. You know, in preparation for a New Year's message, I often will look at what others have said. This is a taken from a message, and it said, put it this way, the worldwide global con uh, economic crisis has cost trillions of dollars in lost wealth. People who only a year ago had a reasonable prospect for a future has seen a lifetime of hard work wiped out. Gun sales are up. People are amassing cash and gold. People starting to grow their own food. And on top of that, people have lost faith in government. They feel that they have been lied to. The moment we are living now is a strange one, a disquieting one that seems full of endings. This statement might surprise you when you know that this sermon was written 12 years ago in March of 2009. So let's look back to 2020 for a few moments. The year began well. 2019 had come to a close. Times were good. Stock market was high. Consumer confidence exuberant. Retail and online sales were strong. And then COVID-19 hit in March 2020. Without going through all of the history of it, for most of us really uh, have heard a lot about it, but let's just review a portion of the history. Passenger ships were left stranded at ports. Vacationers found themselves locked into the rooms as virtual prisoners. People became sick. Images of ambulances and those on hospital beds became commonplace. Death reports demonstrated that this disease was extremely serious. And in Italy, COVID patients overwhelmed the entire medical system. Reports of excessive high death rates followed. Everyone across the globe became frightened at this strange illness. COVID was a disease apparently that had no cure, no treatment options, no immunity. As the first four months passed, death and hospital rates across Canada started to slowly drop and hospitals emptied and a partial business reopening followed. Summer resumed with heat, a little bit of relaxation, but not a lot of travel. Businesses and churches were still reopened, but with reduced smaller gatherings, large events and sports gatherings were canceled across the globe. Outdoor and indoor music concerts disappeared. Air travel was virtually put to a stop. And all the while, thousands of Canadians experienced this dreaded disease. As we approached this year's past Christmas, many saw strange images. Stores, who would normally be thronged with uh, shoppers listening to Christmas music and fighting for the latest in fashions and gadgets, found themselves instead virtually empty. Our own BFA Christmas Eve service, in an effort to make it more safety-friendly, shifted to Zoom. Candy bags normally given out at the event were now distributed at an earlier time. Shillington Community Church, which had previously enjoyed some of its most encouraging times of worship ever, was now closed until the expiry of this lockdown. But is this different from the past? The nation of Israel went through its own various times of great lockdowns too. During the invasion of King Nebuchadnezzar under the mighty rule of Babylon, Jerusalem was under siege. Jeremiah had been thrown into prison, Jeremiah 37, 15, and I believe it was here that he wrote this lamentation about his experience. This book is both a prayer and a chronicle 
of the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. But more importantly, it's a look into the heart of how to handle life challenges. When life throws muck at you, what do you do? Well, someone has said, if you want to find out what's inside a person, the way to find out what's inside is just give that vessel a little nudge or a shake. Whatever spills out, that's what's been inside all the time. And when you look at Jeremiah chapter 3, the middle, the heart of this book, when you look at that, you see what spills out of Jeremiah's heart. Actually, what spills out is five keys to hope in 2021. Let's read the passage and then we'll kind of review some of these five keys. And I hope you'll stay with me for the entire time because each one of these keys is important to come to the hope that so many need at this time. Verse 16 to 18, the first three verses, he has broken my teeth with gravel. Chapter three of Lamentations. He's covered me with ashes. You have moved my soul far from peace. I've forgotten prosperity. And I said, my strength and my hope have perished from the Lord. The next three verses, 19 to 21, remember my infliction and my roaming, the wormwood and the gall, my soul still remembers and sinks within me. I recall this to mind, therefore I have hope. Verses 22 to 24. Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed, because his compassion fails not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. And the fourth hope. Verses 25 to 27. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is a good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man to bear the yoke in his youth. And then verses 28 to 30, let him sit alone and keep silent because God has laid it on him. Let him put his mouth in the dust. There may yet be hope. Let him give his cheek to the one who strikes him and be full of reproach. The Hebrew Christians in the New Testament times understood something of what was going on in Jeremiah's day because they too went through great persecution, great trials, great tribulation. And the writer to the Hebrews in Hebrews 13, verse 8, said it this way. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Past, present, and future, Jesus Christ, our Savior, and the lover of our souls, is the same. And he still is that way to you today. So how do we have the five keys for hope? Well, the first key is the acceptance key. The acceptance that there is a problem. The writer Jeremiah speaks of imagery that is pretty hard to, to, to understand. The poet pictures himself as a guest at a feast. He's been fed, crammed, and sated, but his food is not the normal Christmas turkey and cranberries. Instead, he's been made drunk with wormwood. His bread has been mixed with gravel. He's been eating not the great food, but bitterness to the soul. Anyone can experience the biting of a piece of gravel knows how damaging that is to your teeth. But contrary to these images is the images from Psalms 103, where the father, the everlasting father is pictured as a father who pities his children. And so how do we, how do we understand these two contrasting pictures? Why would a God who pities his children allow such suffering to go through? Well, the first aspect, the first key to hope is to understand that you need to realize you're in a desperate situation and you need God. My strength and my hope are perished. The prophet in verse 18 realizes that his strength is gone. His hope is gone. He has nothing left to give. In today's age, we're often encouraged to consider our own selves. We can do it. We have enough strength in ourselves. We are powerful in ourselves. But it's not ourselves that are going to give us that hope. It's the Lord himself. And how do we get that hope? We call upon him in prayer in sincere prayer. I remember the shortest prayer I ever prayed. We were approaching Timmins early one winter night. Becky and I drove the old Ford on our way to an evening preaching assignment. The roads were snow packed. 
We rounded the corner and my back tires began to fish tail. I sought to regain control and overreacted with a hard left turn. My car now spun to the left. I could see a car approaching as we slid over the center line. I let out a quick audible prayer, Lord help me. As Becky and I swung the uh, to, again to the right and then back to the left again, barely missing that oncoming car, uh, vehicle. And we bounced off a guardrail and then returned to the right-hand lane, which time? The car had now slowed down and stayed on the road without further incident as if nothing had actually ever happened. We were a bit late to the meeting that night, but nevertheless grateful that God had heard our heartfelt prayer. And the same is true with Peter. Yes, Peter walked on water, the only disciple who ever did. But he also sank under the waves as he started looking around at the problems. We too can do that. If we get our eyes off of the Lord Jesus and start looking at the waves around us and all the troubles that are going on around about us, we need to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And his call was to Jesus, Lord, save me, he said. And he was brought to deliverance. Hannah had no children, but in her anguish, she prayed sincerely for a boy, for a child. And that prayer too was answered. And David called upon the Lord. In 1 Samuel 30, as he came to his back to his hometown and discovered that his entire city had been taken and raised to the ground and his entire family and flocks and wealth had been destroyed. As David was greatly distressed, the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people were grieved, every man for his sons and daughters, but David strengthened himself and the Lord is God. Only when we've been truly praying do we come away with peace. And so the first key is acceptance and prayer. That brings hope. The second key is found in verses 19 to 21. Three more verses. Remember my affliction. My soul remembers. I recall this to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. We need to use our history and our memory to recall the goodness of God. You know, this started this year, I took a few moments in my pages of the journal to review what 2021, 2020 was like. And two pages with over 11 different events stood out in contrast to God's way of dealing blessing in our lives. For these events were for our good. Now, as I share this point to some of you, you will say, my life was not good this past year. And I want you to know that we cannot minimize the suffering, sorrow, and sacrifice that has been the cup of so many during this past year. I want you to know that I too share your sorrows, but even more, Jesus, the man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, wants you to know that he identifies with your suffering. He feels your hurt. He shares your pain. And as we look at the cross of Jesus, we too can say, was there any suffering like unto his? Yet as Jesus looked down from the place of suffering and looks down to this court of time, right now to you, in your place, right now, this I know, he says, I understand. I care. I love you. And I'm here to strengthen you. And I'm here to give you new life. For he says, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. He didn't just come to get, make us a more religious people. He didn't just come to make us a better person. No, he came to make the dead alive. And if you will but turn to me and call upon me, the Lord Jesus says, I will give you hope. And this reason you can have hope. But then there is the present mercies. Right now, this day, though the Lord's mercies, we've not been consumed. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. Wow, that's a powerful statement. The Lord is my portion. He is my substance. He is my sustenance. He is my, my air. He is my life. He is the bread of life. He is my water of life. You know, you can't go very long without those, those various substance. And he is our all. It is the Lord's mercies were not consumed. Notice that the Lord Prophet Jeremiah, um, the, the Prophet Jeremiah declared that the Lord God was his portion. It was not his abilities, it's not his talents, it's not his gifts or station of life, but it was the Lord who gave Jeremiah hope. Now, we know that love is a powerful human quality. And in June 2015, 
the city of Paris had to remove 45 tons of padlocks. That's 90,000 pounds of, of, uh, of padlocks or 40,000 kilograms. These were locked on the Ponts de Arts pedestrian bridge. And as a romantic gesture, couples would etch their initials into the lock, attach it to the railing, click it shut, and throw the key into the river Seine. And after this ritual was repeated thousands of times, the bridge could no longer bear the weight of so much love. These love locks had to go. These logs, locks were meant to symbolize everlasting love, but human love does not last. God's love. There is only one constant enduring love, and that is the love of the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord. He is good. His love endures forever. Psalms 106 verse 1. And Jeremiah would say in Jeremiah 29 11, one of our favorite verses for a guy who went through so much, ah, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. This is his promise. Do you believe it? This is his promise to you right now. He wants to give you a future and a hope. But then there is the future expectations. For the Psalms, uh, the, the prophet here writes in verses 25 to 27, the Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man to bear the yoke in his youth. You notice that he repeats this theme of goodness. The Lord is good. It is good. It is good for a man to bear his yoke in his youth. You know, the, you, those of you that are young and you feel tired, you feel discouraged, just remember this. I've been in your shoes and I know what it's like to be tired and it does get better. But you have strength that the seniors and the elderly people do not have. And so push on for God while you have strength for him. It is good to bear your, the yoke in your youth. The Lord is good to us. And the future deliverance is that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Romans eight twenty eight. Yes, even a pandemic or a sickness is still part of the goodness of God. We've now come into this new year. And why is this so important? Because we live in time. And the timeless one has given us this new year celebration to live better, to improve week by week, month by month, and a year to renew. Imagine what it's like. Some have calculated that by the time your lifetime is over, you will have spent six months at stoplights, eight months opening junk mail, and a whooping five years standing in lines. Wow. Where's it all go? Well, there's somebody who knows at least something of where it's all gone. But cannot we give our moments to God, not just those times that we call wasted time? The next time we're in line, the next time we're in a grocery line, Maybe we could take that to pray for those round about us or to look to figure out how we can do some act of kindness for those who are with us. It is good for the salvation of the Lord. Wow, it's good for those who wait to the soul who seeks him. Are you seeking him right now? I trust you are. You know, this is looking forward with future expectations and it is getting better, even though it's a very, very difficult time. The final part of this, uh, this uh, prophet's key, the final key to hope, okay, is not only acceptance, it's not only past, present, and future awareness and love from God, the one who is leading us, but it's finally surrendering personal liberties brings hope. Verses 28 to 30. Let him sit alone and keep silent because God has laid it on him. Let him put his mouth in the dust. There may yet be hope. Let him give his cheek to the one who strikes him and be full of reproach. Now, this is a prophetic verse that speaks entirely of the Lord Jesus. But it also speaks of we who serve him. Because the theme here is what are we doing to allow the Lord to bring us to a place where we are actively doing something that causes someone else to come to hope or to faith in Jesus Christ. 
This is an amazing thing. You remember seeing a photo of a man mowing his lawn while a tornado raced behind him a few miles away? This photo was all the rage in the media and it made the news of many TV broadcasts. What you may not know that is Phil Calloway from Laugh Again fame tells us that this man was a neighbor to Phil. And Phil was able to witness, to interview this man about the event. His neighbor, Thunis Wessels, explained it this way. The tornado looked much closer. If you look at the photo, it's not really far away. Well, not really far away, but not it wasn't far away for us. Phil, Phil says that this guy, some people think of him as crazier than a $4 bill, but not him. Absolutely. If there's a tornado coming, please take cover. But the photo reminds me of a tiny bird perched on a nest while a thundering waterfall misses it by inches. It reminds me of storms that enter all our lives. Soldiers deployed overseas actually contacted Thunis to say to him how much they t that photo spoke to them of the courage they needed to carry on. Phil asked Thunis about storms. Oh yes, he said, I've had my share. One hit me while he was leading a pack of climbing up Russia's highest peak. I slipped and fell 100 meters and they vacuumated me 200 meters short of reaching the summit. That was my lifelong dream. Maybe that tornado prepared me for that one. And then he told Phil his secret. It's part of a story the papers and TV shows didn't tell. If your heart and soul belong to God, he says, storms will come. We still ask, why does this happen to us? We don't know. But we know one day we will find out. So keep your faith. You're in his hands. Trust God and be faithful. Or someone said on Twitter, when the going gets tough, the tough get mowing. So what will 2021 bring? You cannot predict the way this year will pass any more than you could have predicted last year. But what you can do is resolve with the hope that is set before us to live a life of sacrifice, to trust in God's goodness for every future situation, his present compassion, his past mercies, and acceptance of the lost hope. And as you do this, you can only do this if you've been born again. With repentance and true faith, trust in Jesus and experience that new birth spoken of in John 3, verse 3 and 7, related to Nicodemus, but he's really a representative of us all. Romans 10, 9 and 10, Paul says, On behalf of God, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes in the righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And let me remind you that only you know whether that's true faith or not. I went through the activity of confession with the mouth and attempting to believe in the heart. But after several attempts to believe in the heart, I realized I couldn't do that part. I couldn't. And I called out to the Lord and I said, I quit. You, you've got to make me alive to you or I will never be able to trust you for anything. And he did. And he will do the same for you. Years ago in London, England, an old man stopped a lady at a train station. Excuse me, ma'am. He said, I want to thank you for something. Thank me, the one lady replied. Yes, I used to be a ticket collector here. And whenever you went by, you always gave me a cheerful smile. And you said a good morning. You don't know what a difference it made to me. Rain or shine, it was always the same. And I said, I wonder, where does she get her smile from? One cannot always be happy. Yet she seems to be. And I knew that your smile came from inside somehow. And one morning you came by and you had a Bible in your hand. And I said to myself, maybe that's where she gets her smile from. So I went home that night and I bought a Bible and I've been reading it ever since. And I found Jesus. And now I can smile too. And I just want to thank you. I hope and pray that in this year 2021, if you are hearing my voice today, you who have not found Jesus will get yourself a Bible and will not rest until you have been found by Jesus. And as you do so, may you be blessed and may God bless you in 2021. Amen and amen.